Good evening. Uh, welcome to Bible study. Uh, session two of When God Seems Unfair. We are studying the book of Habakkuk. As you see, we are not in the sanctuary. Uh, you also see that I am not Pastor Smith. Uh, but we are going to push through and go ahead and have Bible study. We lost power here at the church, and so we're having to utilize other means of technology uh, such that we can continue to meet together virtually, open up God's word, and have our conversation and continue to hear what God has said, what God is saying, and what God will continue to say to us through the book of Habakkuk. It's great to be with you all. I uh, want to give a few announcements. As we do the announcements, I would ask that everyone open your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 2. Pastor Smith encouraged us at the beginning of this series to have our Bibles with us and to read this passage. Uh, here's an example of why it is imperative to do so. We never know when we are going to uh, be put in a situation where we have to just go back to kind of doing it old school like we used to and just having our Bibles and being able to talk with each other. So please, ma'am, please, sir, open your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 2 uh, as we have some announcements and then we will do a brief review before we get into uh, chapter 2 verses 6 through 20. I do have some good news to share. Uh, as you know, we had uh, previously up until the last few weeks, we had been streaming live on YouTube. Uh, we ran into some challenges that we had to really work through. Um, thank you to uh, Mr. Maurice Patterson, who's the leader of our media ministry, uh, Daryl Turner, and the rest of the media team. Thank you for how you've worked. I'm proud and, and excited to let everyone know that beginning on Sunday, uh, we should be able to restream again on YouTube. Uh, so please pass the word. Uh, we will again on Sunday. Lord says the same. We have no glitches. On Sunday, we will resume streaming on our YouTube channel for Sunday morning worship service at 930, as well as also noonday Bible study on Tuesdays, as well as Bible study on Wednesdays. Uh, thank you to everyone who came out on Monday. Um, we were able to provide 500 boxes again of fruits and vegetables. Um, thank you, Mount Olive, for your support. Thank you for continuing to do ministry, continuing to partner with God to meet the, meet the needs of God's people. Thank you for showing up and showing out. Special thanks to the men of Mount Olive who have showed up excited to continue to serve in ministry so that we can continue to be a part of God meeting needs. And we will do it again on Monday from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. So again, let's get into um, our Bible study session uh, we have the title for the entire series is When God Seems Unfair. When we're experiencing what's going on with the coronavirus, even experiencing what is going on uh, with the racial tensions and how we're grappling with something that has been around for quite some time, and that is the inequalities uh, that exist in this country and even in this world, sometimes it can seem as if God has forgotten us, if God is not holding up his end of the bargain, if God is not fulfilling the promises that we know and love in Scripture. Now, we know that's not the case, but sometimes it doesn't feel like that's the case. And this is one of those times where it may be challenging for us to actually feel uh, God's presence and God being on our side, God being on the side of his sons and his daughters. Again, we know that that is a case. We believe that that is a case. However, sometimes it's challenging to feel that God is on our side. That's not really much difference than what we find here in the context of this book. Uh, as Pastor has already told us, Habakkuk in chapter 1 complained to God. God answered him. And that's encouraging to me because there are times where we have to be honest, have to... God wants us to hear. Can you all hear me? Is the sound okay? Okay. Miss Karen, turn your volume up on your phone. Uh, 
we're monitoring the sound and it's okay on our end. Uh, everyone make sure your devices are turned up um, as high as possible. Uh, but the context of Habakkuk is similar to what we're experiencing. Uh, the people were in a situation where they were wondering why God was allowing evil to happen. Why God was allowing people to feel the pressures of evil. Why God was allowing his own people to experience what is going on in their society. It's the same disparities, and we're going to get into these in particular in, in verses 6 through 20 of chapter 2. And we're going to read it together and take it apart and walk through it. But again, that's good. It, it's, it's encouraging to me that Habakkuk complained and then Habakkuk was answered. We can be honest and open with God. When we're struggling, when we're challenging, when we feel the weight of the world on us, we can be open and honest with God. Let God know, I don't like what I'm feeling. I don't like what I'm experiencing. We can even ask God questions. Not only do we have that here in Habakkuk, Job is an example. Job is a book full of questions, and God responds to Job as well. When God responds to Job, he doesn't respond to Job and tell Job not to question him. He doesn't tell Job it's even wrong for him to question. What God does say is that we have to be mindful of how we question God. We can ask God questions. We can question God. But we have to remember who we're talking to. It's kind of like us and our parents. We can have conversation with our parents. We can be open and honest with our parents. However, we also know we have to be respectful. We have to have some reverence because they're our parents and not our buddies and not our friends like some other people. And so there is a different way we approach our parents. There may even be different language that we use when we talk to our parents. I use that example because God is our father. So we can go to God openly and honestly, letting God know we're struggling, how we're feeling, how we're processing these emotions uh, that God is providing for us, that God is providing for us. And so we still, uh, we, we still can go to God openly and honestly. Yes, if you have questions at any time, post them and we'll do our best to answer them. Then Habakkuk complains again in chapter, at the end of chapter one, uh, we started out last week on that response and how God replied. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go back through that. We do encourage you, if you missed last week or want to go back to verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2, uh, pastor is, uh, Pastor's uh, explanation of it is still on Facebook. You can watch from last week. Media team is also working to uh, upload that to YouTube. But we're going to look at and unpack chapter 2, verses 6 through 20. There are five woes uh, that we experience here. Different versions, different translations uh, have some different words. NRSV has alas. I'm going to read from the NIV uh, because these woes are important. We even hear Jesus saying some woes in uh, the New Testament. And if we want to know what woe means, uh, W-O-E, uh, when we break it down, uh, doing the etymology of the word, we break it down theologically. I mean, it's real deep. It's ooh we. That's what woe means. It's kind of like when uh, we were kids and we were with our cousins or brothers and sisters, and the parents weren't around, or grandparents weren't around, there wasn't an adult around, and one of us broke something. And the other kids around would look around, and guess what everybody would say? Ooh, you in trouble now. That's what these woes mean in a real sense for you and for me. In our language, in our day and time, this is a ooh-wee moment. And God is saying to those that are oppressing his people, ooh-wee. And the people are saying, ooh-wee, you in trouble now. Now, now meaning God is aware of what is happening to God's people at all times. We cannot definitively say in a particular time when God is going to act or how God is going to act. But we can say based on God's holy word that God is aware of what we're going through and God is going to act. So that is what we have here. Let me also say this about the context of Habakkuk. There is not conclusive evidence for us to know exactly who and what was being done 
where the people were. It might have been uh, Babylonian captivity. It could have been Assyrian captivity. But some foreign presence had come in and they had taken the money, taken everything from uh, God's people. And it's a blessing in a sense that we don't know for sure who was doing it because that leaves it open-ended. They leave it open-ended and that's a blessing because what is here goes for any person, any system of oppression and marginalization that is in place to know that God has been, God is, and God will always be against the mistreatment of people. Not only his people, but people in general because God loves all people and God continuously extends the offer of salvation based on the finished work of his son Jesus. And so it's open-ended. There's no conclusion about who was oppressing it, the system that was going on in particular. But as we read through these verses, we'll hear what is going on, what God is speaking against God himself, but also uh, through the people themselves. And we're going to say something about that because God can speak through us in our day and age as well. So let's look at verses 6 through 8. I'm under Roman numeral 5 if you have the outline. It is available on the website. On the Roman numeral 5, it says the vindication of faith. Chapter 2, verses 6 through 20. Let's listen to verses 6 through 8. I'm reading again from the NIV. It says, Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey because you have plundered many nations. The peoples who are left will plunder you. You have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. That is inordinate greed. We know that greed is the desire as well as the actions that show that we want more than we really need. That's when we know we have more than enough shoes, we know we have more than enough clothes, more than enough food, and yet we still accumulate more and more instead of doing with the resources God has blessed us with, what God is asking us to do. Sometimes that just starts with, you know what, Lord, you've provided me with enough, you provided me with more than enough. I don't need anything else in these areas. Is there some way I can partner with you to be a blessing to other people? That's the opposite of greed. And that's somewhat on an individual level. Now, we see on a, a corporate and a communal level this done at another. We see this word uh, who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. Um, this is not the place. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But it talks about plundering many nations. When we look at... Some of the resources that we have and the global nature of our economy, there are places in this world that people are barely getting paid, if at all, and it results in people making billions of dollars. Of course, this could apply to people in high places of the government, but this can also apply to people in high places of, of uh, corporations, other forms of leadership where we know that the way that we get the goods and resources are unfair, people are put in unsafe positions, they aren't compensated to live a holistic life. Give an example uh, with chocolate. Chocolate comes from West Africa. And there are children who do that farming and don't get any pay for it, and that results in some of the chocolate that you and I see at our stores. That's an example of something here that God is speaking against is that there are times when people are not put in safe, healthy environments and then the results come into this greed that we have that we want to make money and accumulate money, accumulate possessions by any means necessary. God is saying through the people that one day you can take advantage of, of people just for so long. And God will present opportunities for us to do right. And if we don't do right, at some point, we're going to experience the consequences. We open ourselves up literally to experience the consequences 
of treating people wrong, of doing people wrong. And this particular example, it is about inordinate greed, wanting more, knowing we don't need any more, knowing that we can utilize what we have to be a blessing to other people. Then we continue reading. Um, it says, woe to him who builds his house. This is the hunger to dominate verses nine through 11. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruins of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Here is this idea that they want to people that are in positions of power, in positions to change the culture, change laws, change society don't do anything about it and not only do they not do anything about it but it mentions this setting their nest on high that's this imagery of an eagle having a nest high up on a cliff what this means is these people that are in this position they fortify their homes they fortify uh, themselves and and they build up fences around their houses uh, they fortify they get all the security they can for themselves and they hide out and they do that because they think if they do that, they can protect themselves from the negative consequences that can come from treating people poorly, from taking advantage of people, from taking people's money, uh, from, from building onto this ordinary greed. All of these build on to each other. That's what that nest on high means. They have this false sense of security that they can build these fences, get all of these cameras. Uh, have all of the uh, security that they want around their houses in terms of people or the military and so on and so forth, that they are then safe. But what God is telling them, it doesn't matter how much security you pay for, what you put up around your house, your palace, if you will. When it's time for you to experience the consequences of doing wrong, you can't protect yourself from me. And that's a promise that we should live in and we should be aware of because sometimes we can look at what is happening and not think that God is paying attention or we think it, it looks like people are getting away with stuff. People are not getting away with stuff. We see at the time that people put certain things on their social media page, they're not getting any rest. They're not sleeping. They're being tormented. And so even now, some of the people that are doing wrong in our current context, if we pay close attention, we can see they're not getting away with it. There's a lot of turnover. When you see a corporation of any kind having a lot of turnover in their jobs, people can't keep a job at a particular corporation. They keep hiring people and firing people, hiring people and firing people. That's an indication that there's a lot going on, that they're unsettled, they're not at peace. So please, ma'am, please, sir, don't think anybody gets away with treating people God, treating people that God loves, which is all people wrong in any shape, shape, form or fashion. And unfortunately, we see it doesn't seem like there's any change here because they're continuing to do so. And look at that last verse in 11. It says the stones will cry out. The beams of the woodwork will echo it. We have to remember stones and wood are part of God's creation, too. If we do, if we keep pushing God can use stones and wood and any other parts of his creation to get to us and to let us know who still sits on the throne, who's in power and the expectation that God has had, does have and will always have. OK, let's keep going and read verses 12 through 14. And we see some atrocities. It says, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I love verse 14. But what this is talking about here is there were houses and palaces and entire infrastructures built in this context by slaves. There are people that were barely being paid, if at all, 
and yet these nice, beautiful palaces with all of these decorations were built. These cities were built and they looked nice, but it was only built for certain people. The White House in this country was built by slaves, just as an example of the correlation to our context and their context. It also doesn't seem to be any uh, accident what that house is called. That's another conversation for another day. But that was built by slaves. And if we look at how much money flows through this country, the industries that we have, and we follow the money trail back long enough, we'll notice that much of this country, if not all of this country, was built on the back of not only African slaves, but people, brown people on the West Coast and, and Asian people on the West Coast and other places. And we know even some of the details from internment camps in the 40s and 30s and other, other situations. But there has been inequalities throughout the history of this country. And every turn we look, if we follow the trail, if we learn our history, we will see that what we're seeing now is a symptom of the disease. Let us not be fooled and look at one person or one group of people uh, in a particular party. No, we have to know our history because in this country, what is going on now? The negativity that we see, uh, the, the, the systems that are being exposed that are flawed and there is not equality there for gender, race, and class. We're seeing the symptoms of a system that has been a major disease and we're experiencing the system. Going to say some more about that as we close, but I wanted to make sure we say that because it's right here in, in the scripture. That's how I wanted you to read it. So you're not saying Marcel making this up and, and making us talk about this. No, it's right there in verses 12 through 14. They built a city with bloodshed and established towns by injustice. And in the same way, in many ways, that fits our context directly. So those are the atrocities. Then we have debauchery. That's one of my favorite words to say. I always like to say that every time I see it in scripture. But here is debauchery, verses 15 through 17. It says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so that they can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. There, there's quite a bit here. Verse 15, when it says about the shame and the drunkenness and the nakedness, this brings back to our memory what happened with Noah, what happened with Lot. Noah and Lot got drunk as a skunk and they got taken advantage of. Go back and read it in Genesis. Uh, but that's what happened. That here is, is what um, God knew the people would resonate with when they heard this and read this. They knew exactly what it was talking about. It is not literally... God condemning the drunkenness per se. It is more about how people can be taken advantage of and given something uh, by people, by another group of people that they know is not good from them. And they are uh, taking advantage of them. They're exploiting them. Uh, after this, we're going to post something that we want you to watch that is related to this about systemic oppression on the Facebook page. And we want you to watch how this has happened with the lending system in this country and how people have been tricked into poverty because of a lack of information and a lack of options. That is here what is being talked about metaphorically. This is some poetry that we have and that's what is being talked about is that people can be given something and take advantage of, taken advantage of at their weakest moment and something can happen. So then we go past verse 15 it talks about that that uh, being taken advantage of. Then it says, uh, let your nakedness be exposed. And we kind of already touched on that. We see since the coronavirus has started, how much has been, been exposed about our food system, about our agricultural system, about our economy, 
about all the industries that are in this country, we see that there are some things being exposed and everyone does not, even in the healthcare especially, the coronavirus is affecting certain segments of our population differently because of the lack of access that certain people have based on their race and based on their zip code. That's not something new, but the coronavirus just exposed it and caused it to be discussed at a higher, more frequent level. And hopefully we're paying attention to that because God wants his people to respond to that so that that happens. So we're seeing this exposure. That's what God is talking about here. It says the cup from the God's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. Listen, people that continue to treat God's people wrong, people that continue to treat people less than human, at some point they will be disgraced. We can look at this even in history. There are some people who we still look at favorably in history, but once their legacies are talked about, there are other people we don't look at favorably in history. Sometimes we didn't even understand them. Give you an example. When we look at some of the leaders uh, with both of the world wars, world wars in the 1900s, there were great leaders who used what they had been given for evil. And we see how we look at them in hindsight. They were abusing the Bible. They were abusing God's name, saying that this was what God wanted to do. This race of people is superior to that race of people. And all of this evil came about. And we see how those leaders died. Go back and look at how Hitler died and how Mussolini died and how some of these other people died. They were on the wrong side of history. And even some of the speeches they gave, they invoked that God was on their side. And that's a warning because no race of people, no country, no government is more favored by God than the other. God loves all people because God created all people and he wants all people to flourish. And the only way that happens is if all people have access to everything that's God's in the first place. And we have to stop doing this with what God has given us and do this with it. So here it is. We, if we're on the wrong side of history, at some point, we will be disgraced. Then it says, the violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you. Here it is. The, the cedars of Lebanon, there was a forest in Lebanon, and Pastor referenced this in a sermon recently. We showed this picture, this beautiful trees that were in Lebanon. And when this happened, as well as other times, that countries came into Israel and the Levant. These trees were cut down and taken away to be used to build stuff. And there was no restraint. They just came in and destroyed the forest. When they destroyed the forest, then animals were harmed too. Uh, indirectly, but also directly, they were over hunting and over fishing. That's literally what happens in this text. And when that happened, that was sin. That is sin. When we over hunt, over fish, and do what we want or what we think we want with nature, God is saying here, if we do that, there are consequences to it. We need those trees to breathe. Uh, we need those fish to eat. But there may be humans coming after us that need to eat too. And so we should not abuse God's creation uh, just because we think we can and we're given it. The Bible does not, in the original language, say that we have dominion over the earth. It tells us to observe and preserve the earth if we observe the earth we learn from it if we preserve it we work with it we will then be blessed as well with our physical health and even mental health studies have shown if we spend time outside that's good for our minds and our mental health as well so here's what god is saying they have destroyed creation they've destroyed animals and now he is going to allow it to terrify them we see that going on right now. We didn't listen. Some of us didn't listen when it came up to climate change. Some of us didn't listen when it came up to global warming and we saw the destruction and God told us to sit down somewhere and be still. And lo and behold, nature started to regenerate. Nature started to do some healing. And that is not by accident. And what God wants us to take from that, and it's multiple, multiple lessons. But one thing God wants us to take from that is, listen to me, 
and take care of my creation that I'm allowing you to work with me to take care of. If you don't take care of it, I can do this again. Think about how quickly coronavirus snuck up on us and shut everything down. Let's not miss that because that's what's going on. It is uncomfortable. It is challenging. I doubt if any of us are really loving it or liking it. But there are blessings in this too that we hopefully are getting and we're prayerfully asking God, whatever is going on, there are lessons you want us to learn and help us not to miss those lessons. And one of it, which is right here in verse 17 about the violence and destruction in nature. And then it says, for you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. That is God speaking directly to that. So that's the debauchery. And then we have idolatry. And in a sense, this idolatry is 18 to 20. If you have that outline, please correct it. It should be 18, not 8. But this idolatry kind of wraps up all of it. Listen to what it says. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman? Or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Oftentimes we think that idols are some type of uh figurine that we can sit in front of and we pray to it or we we depend on it that can be an idol but an idol is anything that we depend on more than God an idol is any person any possession it can be money um, it can be a vehicle it can be overtime it can be anything that is more important to God Yes, it can be us having that declaration that is more than more important to us than God. But then it also can become how we spend our time. There are times when we will do what's important to us and not pray about it, not cons consent God about it. And we just go and do something and then wonder when stuff starts unraveling. And sometimes that's how God speaks to us to let us know. You are putting something or someone before me. You are putting a creation or a resource. You're putting a creation before the creator or we're putting a resource before the source. And when we do that, uh, we can we can bet our bottom dollar that after some period of time, as we're learning in this text, among others, that as we're going to experience those consequences. If our job is more important and we're not going, we're not participating in the life of the church, we're not uh, using what God blesses us with for God's glory. At some point, that's going to catch up with us when we know better. And, and let me say this. Uh, if we know better, God's going to treat us like we know better. If God blesses us with money and we know what we're supposed to be doing with that money and we choose not to do it and make excuses with that money, God is going to respond to us as we know better. If we have a vehicle and we're not taking care of that vehicle, not keeping that oil changed, uh, not washing it, eventually that car is going to respond and that's going to be God kind of letting us know you haven't been taking care of what I blessed you with. Same thing goes with our relationship. If we've been blessed with people, blessed with spouses, blessed with children, parents, cousins, aunties, uncles, extended family, church family, and God has encouraged us and inspired us to be a part of their lives in particularly in spe excuse me, specific ways and we ignore it and we say, well, they're going to do this with that. That's not our business. We're just supposed to respond to God and do what God has asked us to do and leave the rest to God. Maybe they're not going to give it back to you. That's not our concern. We should trust that in some shape, form or fashion, God is going to give it back to us how he chooses. And it may simply be that we don't lack. So if we know better, God's going to treat us like we know better. So that's what this idolatry is. It may not be an object and we can run and we can look at some people of other religion and some of the figurines that they have and 
You know, they'll sit them in certain rooms in their house and worship them. But if we're honest, there are some times where we make uh, some things in Christianity idols. We, we can make our, our cross necklaces an idol. Uh, we can think that it has good luck in it. Uh, uh, we can we can make certain other things an idol and, and put more power in that than just focusing on God. And so we can't be critical of people of other religions or even people we think don't have enough faith or however you might want to say it. But we have to be careful and just focus on making sure we're not participating in idolatry and also with our families doing what we can to encourage and create an environment in our homes and in our families and in our churches uh, such that idolatry is not being committed. And it talks about lifeless stone. Again, it's anything that is created that we're putting above the creator or any resource that we're putting above the source. There's one creator and there's one source. That's the only somebody we should be worshiping. And let me say this as a side note. Worship is not just coming to service on Sunday morning or joining us Sunday morning. Uh, worship is not shouting. Worship is not just singing. Uh, worship is not those uh, outlandish or or. Uh, physical manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Worship, in terms of the biblical definition, is a life given over to God holistically. So Sunday through Saturday, not just Sunday, not just Wednesday, not just when we're in ministry meeting, not just when we're in small groups or classes. It is every day and every hour of every day striving to live for God. God is not asking us to be perfect. God is asking us to be faithful. And it can be done. Uh, and we have to keep that before us that if God is asking for it, it can be done. It may take some yield, some more yielding and some some sacrifice on our part for stuff that we want, for stuff that we need, which is what God is. We need God and God will provide for all our needs. Uh, but worship is a lifestyle. And so if we worship God. All of this other stuff will fall into place. We won't have any problem participating with God, meeting the needs of other people. We won't have any problem sharing the resources that the source gives us with all people in every way uh, and, and, and on and on and on. So let me say this before we do our statement of summation and we close. One of the main ways that we can participate with God meeting the needs of people is voting. I saw the stories about what's going on in Georgia. There are other places that there's voter suppression and that is an act of the devil. Sometimes we, we want to say some things of the devil and trivial, make jokes of it in these red suits on Halloween and some of these TV shows and movie. But what the Bible says, when particularly in Ephesians 6, the devil and demons are described as being strategic, as being intelligent, and as being crafty. And there's some other definitions there. And we have those multiple definitions. Because the devil knows the Bible, the devil knows us, and the devil knows how to manipulate systems so that certain people and evil and division continues to be present. A way that we can do it, and this is a part of us responding with the sword of the spirit, because uh, the government can be a means of grace. Politics can be a means of grace. I'm not suggesting we depend on the government. We should do ministry because God has called us to do ministry. We should always do ministry. We should always participate with God and meet the needs of people. One way we participate in ministry is participating in the political process. I'm not just talking about the presidential level. I'm not just talking about the national level. We should be knowledgeable voters of every person and every issue on the ballot every time there's an election so that we can then be prayerful and vote to make sure that everyone has access to all of their needs through the government as well as through the local church. I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the people of God. So that is a way to do it. And, and please know that we're working to get that information for our election coming up in August and in November so that you, you can have the information. We, we are not going to tell you how to vote. We are not going to tell you who to vote for. What we are going to do is provide information so that we can participate with God as God is speaking through the people saying, we can't continue to allow people to be taken advantage of. 
We can't continue to allow exploitation and extortion and injustices and iniquities and inequalities. We can't continue to allow that because we have to be honest about that particular piece of it. So that is one way we can participate in it. But as a church, we continue to always provide for people's needs in our own individual context, our jobs and organizations. We should uh, speak up and speak out on behalf of those who need to be spoken up to and spoken out. And right now, it seems like our country is turning the corner. But let's remember, this is like a, this is a large ship and a large ship takes some time to turn. And just like it took hundreds of years for this system to dig its tentacles into this fabric of this nation and this country, we have to have a sustained effort to make sure that we turn this ship. So, again, that's just an example of how we can have a vindication of our faith. And we have to know that if we're doing what's right according to God, that God is on our side. Just as God sent all of these prophets in the Bible, he sent all of these men and women throughout Scripture, and we're still talking about them thousands of years later. The same God that was with them is with us. And let me say this statement of summation, and we will be done uh, for this week. God still warns all tyrants, dictators, presidents, and any who have authority over people to mark their steps for the fivefold woes are just samples of what awaits those who are not only bellicose in their threatenings against others, but also resistant to God's principle of life. Let me read that again. God still warns all tyrants, dictators, presidents, and any who have authority over people to mark their steps. For the fivefold woes are just samples of what awaits those who are not only bellicose in their threatenings against others, but also resistant to God's principle of life. Scripture reference for that in addition to this passage is Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Now, notice it mentions the threatenings against others. We don't have to get uncomfortable. We don't have to get afraid, be scared about certain threats from certain people. Again, if we're participating in righteousness, if we're participating with what is right according to God. We have these five woes we just went through. Those woes, again, are a sample of what is facing people who are doing wrong against people. We have to remember God loves all people. We're all God's by creation. God continuously extends offer, offer for us all to be his by confession as well. So, again, we don't have to be concerned. Let's not. Let's stay off of Twitter and Facebook so much because sometimes uh, we can read certain stuff. They can get our blood pressure high. And this is an example of God reminding us to be aware of but not be anxious about what people are saying, what people are doing. Our response as pastor preached on Sunday, be angry, but do not sin. And that means we, we got to not hold some stuff in. We got to go vote in August. We got to go vote in November. We got to vote in every election that we have the opportunity to. We have to hold our politicians accountable. And in, in every organization we are part of, that's the way we can respond to make sure that there's equity and equality. And we can't be afraid because we have to have faith over fear in that sense. Uh, we have to trust that if we're doing right by God, that the same God is with all of these men and women in Scripture is with us as we're standing on his right side. Again, we're going to post something, a video uh, that Pastor wants you all to see. Um, we're going to post it on Facebook after we finish this session in a few seconds. But also, I know some came on late. Again, we're happy to announce and thank you again to Mr. Patterson, Maurice Patterson, to Adele Turner and the rest of the media team. We will be able to stream service on Sunday on YouTube. So please pass the word uh, that we will again start streaming on Sunday on YouTube. Uh, they worked through the issues diligently. It took some time. But again, thank you that we have that set up. So we return to YouTube on Sunday. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully this has been helpful. Do we have any questions? Do we have any questions? 
Okay, if you all think of some questions, comment on here, uh, and, and I'll do my best to come back and um, come back and answer them. But remember, as the title of this of this lesson says, continue to live by faith in the midst of our frustration. Keep your hope. Stay positive. Be angry, but do not sin. Hold on to what we're experiencing. I pray that we remember what we're experiencing so that this can be a part of our motivation, not just in the short term, but the long term. So we can keep this movement going. So real, uh, uh, real uh, lasting change for ourselves and future generations that what we've experienced in our lifetime, the negative stuff we've experienced, the negative parts of our society that our children and grandchildren won't experience. Keep living by faith in the midst of frustration. I love you. Take care and watch the video that we're going to post in a few seconds. See you Sunday.